Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone to coming uh, for coming to uh, uh, another iteration of the One Pass thematic series on waterways. Um, today we're very pleased to have with us uh, Vera Herr from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and she'll be talking about, what is it, um, Stokes waves in constant vorticity flows. Vera? Okay, um, let me get to the... All right, so I would like to thank the One Pass team and Walter for like, uh, their hard work putting things together for this very nice uh, seminar series. Uh, I enjoyed very much listening to different aspects of uh, this steady water waves, but uh, personally, I was great to be connected with uh, my friends and the academic family through this event. Walter asked me specifically to talk about uh, new mega computations and uh, uh, I believe that this is the only one in this seminar series about the pneumatics. Uh, well, uh, there is a huge research community where people try to study pneumatically water waves. And uh, uh, I'm trained to prove theorems and I do pneumatics only part time. So I will not be able to give a very good survey of uh, what's going on in this pneumatic community. Instead, this talk is going to be about the kind of case study it focuses on the specific numerical project that I've been working on uh, for about three years and that I'm still working on. And the this project, uh, I, had, uh, I have had uh, a great deal of uh, agony and ecstasy. I also told that uh, uh, this seminar series is for students and postdocs and uh, those young analysts in the audience, if you are interested in uh, working with the computational people or like a, you want to do computation yourselves, then perhaps you can take my story as an example or a counter example for the matter. Also, uh, this topic that I'm presenting today, uh, Stokes waves uh, with constant vorticity, it is a much bigger problem than I thought it would be before I started working on it. And there are many great open problems uh, here. So I want to share those problems with you. With that, uh, uh, Sergei Dietchenko is my partner in crime. He was a postdoc at Illinois, and he just started his uh, tenure track position at Buffalo. Now, so the story again goes back to the 19th century. Stokes made many, many important uh, uh, contributions uh, about uh, these period traveling waves at the free surface of water and its two dimensional and irrotational flow. And for simplicity, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, the infinite depth. The depth is infinite, but uh, pretty much everything that I say today can extend to the finite depth. Uh, and the motion is acted on by gravity. And for the most part of this talk, I will neglect the effect of surface tension. So Stokes made many important observations. For example, uh, he, uh, the wave crest uh, becomes sharper and drops flatter as we increase uh, the amplitude and the so-called wave of greatest height will have a sharp corner at the wave crest with the 120 degrees angle inside. About a century later, Amy, Franco, and Toland, and also Plotnikov independently, they proved that a Stokes wave of such an extreme form exists. Uh, obviously, this is a very old problem and I have no time for its long and rich history, but I want to say that for zero vorticity, some recent advances, uh, both analytical and numerical, are based on a reformulation of this problem into a single concise uh, uh, equation that you see in this box uh, due to Babenko in the 80s. Uh, and a couple of uh, words about this Babenko equation. First, this is an exact theory. I mean, a solution to this Babenko equation gives rise to a Stokes wave that solves the stationary Euler equations in the bulk of the fluid together with uh, the kinematic and the dynamic boundary conditions at the free surface and there are no approximations. It is a non-local equation. Here, the script H is the Hilbert transform. And for our purpose, it is a, a fully multiplied operator. Actually, this equation is quasi-linear 
non-local equation. So not the easiest kind to solve, to handle. Nonetheless, uh, uh, the Babenko equation has been studied extensively, both analytically and numerically. Now, a modern way to derive uh, the Babenko equation is to use the conformal mapping idea and suppose that uh, the fluid domain, that is a domain beneath this blue curve that is the, the fluid surface in the X plus I, Y physical domain. Suppose that this is mapped conformally from the lower half plane uh, that is U plus I, V complex plane. And the, the imaginary part of uh, this, uh, uh, imaginary part, uh, the boundary of uh, this such a holomorphic function contains all the information of this solution. For example, the fluid surface in such a conformal co coordinate can be written parametrically and this u, the real value on the conformal, conformal domain is to your parameter. And the horizontal component of this parametric curve is u plus Hilbert transform of y of u, where y of u is the vertical component of uh, your uh, fluid surface. Uh, here c is the wave speed and g is the uh, gravitational constant. Uh, for zero vorticity, some numerical uh, findings. Throughout this work, I'm going to collect the solution in the bifurcation diagram. And uh, uh, in my bifurcation diagram, vertically, let me, uh, I don't have enough space here, but uh, vertically, I measure the wave speed and horizontally, I measure the amplitude or I say S, uh, and S is the dimension is the uh, amplitude parameter I call the stiffness, and then measures the class to, to trough vertical distance divided by one period. After numerical bifurcation or continuation, we will typically have a solution curve in this bifurcation diagram, and each point on this solution curve corresponds to a Stokes wave in the physical domain, X plus I, Y domain, with the corresponding value of uh, stiffness and uh, wave, uh, wave speed. Uh, for zero vorticity, Longi, Higgins, and Fox in the 70s, they combined the numerical computation and uh, uh, formal analysis to predict that uh, the wave speed oscillates infinitely many times while the stiffness, the amplitude monotonically increases towards the extreme wave. Not only the wave, wave speed oscillates, but also the uh, energy and momentum and other physical quantities, they all oscillate, uh, which is uh, still an open problem analytically. Also, this oscillation is uh, not so easy to produce numerically because these oscillations are so, so tiny. For a while, the best result in this direction was Chen and Sopman in the 80s, where did they deserve one and a half oscillations. And it was Sergei's thesis work that he computed the next oscillation. And with that computation, he was able to update, uh, like he was able to give more than 20 decimal digits of the maximum stiffness. So that means uh, approximation of the stiffness of the extreme wave. And this also gives you some idea how much work it involves to go over the next oscillation. Now, uh, vorticity is important in fluid mechanics with or without the fluid surface. And uh, it's now almost 20 years ago that uh, Constantin and Strauss, uh, they did the global bifurcation analysis for arbitrary vorticity, and it was in my thesis problem number one to extend the, the constant in Strauss from the finite depths to the infinite depths. Uh, in these proofs, uh, we assume that there's no overhanging waves and no internal stagnation, so that uh, the fluid surface is a graph, the graph of a single valued function and the fluid particles inside the fluid region, they are slower than the, the wave speed at the surface. Now for zero vorticity, there is proof of uh, no overhanging waves. Uh, and also 
the only possible stagnation point is the wave crest of uh, the extreme wave. So you do not need to assume these properties when you prove something. But for non-zero vorticity, Eric Balen, for example, about 10 years ago, he demonstrated analytically that uh, uh, internal stagnation is possible even in the simplest case of the constant vorticity and even for small amplitude. Therefore, dealing with the non-zero vorticity, we probably would not assume and we probably should not assume these properties of uh, over, no overhanging or like internal stagnations. Uh, uh, they are expected to happen and uh, we want to allow these properties to properly capture the effects of uh, constant vorticity and non-zero vorticity on Stokes waves. Now for constant vorticity, Recently, Konstantin Straubs and Babaruka did global bifurcation analysis, and this new version allows overhanging or internal stagnation point. And uh, they conjectured that uh, a limiting wave that lives at the boundary of the solution set in your bifurcation space is either an extreme wave with an angle at the crest with or without uh, overhanging profile, or else the fluid surface bends to touch itself at the trough line and trapping an air bubble. But uh, it is uh, abstract theory of a global bifurcation that they employed for their proof and it gives uh, the existence of the solutions but almost no information about what a solution must look like. And then it is natural to numerically compute these solutions to better understand this limiting scenario. And that was the departure point of our project. Now, of course, we are not the first team numerically computing these solutions. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, it was not until 85 that Simon and Softman, they first undertook uh, the numerical continuation of this problem. And shortly afterwards, Teles da Silva and Peregrine, they extended the semi softman from the infinite depths to the finite depths. And about decades later, Van den Broek, he revisited the semi softman and he proposed to use uh, a dimensionless uh, uh, gravitational parameter to parameterize a curve, uh, a solution curve, and at the zero gravity limit, he found many exotic looking waves. Now, these three papers are well cited and there is a huge volume of uh, papers that uh, follow, and, and follow up papers of these three. But um, almost all of them, they assume that, that the existence matter was settled by these three papers and they now just turn to like other properties, geometric or dynamic properties of the solutions. Uh, the, our project outcome is that uh, the existence matter is not uh, far from being complete from these three papers, and there are many more solutions yet to be discovered. And while I'm on this page, I want to comment that uh, the Simmons Sapna paper is the Simmons uh, thesis, and that is the Telesta Silva and the Peregrine's paper is uh, Telesta Silva's uh, thesis. And this gives you some idea about the size of this problem and also the quality of uh, this uh, project problem. In fact, uh, it took us uh, well more than two years to have some decent understanding about what's going on in this problem. So it is uh, like that uh, Sergei did uh, his second thesis uh, with me on this project. Now, what makes uh, constant voltage special? Well, we can uh, write the, the velocity as a sum of two parts. And the part one solves uh, zero, zero surface but non-zero constant vorticity inside. And part two solves a non-zero surface but the zero vorticity inside. Part one, we solve explicitly and the solution represents the background linear sure flow and here little omega is the vorticity, constant vorticity. And part two is just like the Stokes wave problem for zero vorticity. So that the solution can be written in terms of uh, phi, uh, the velocity potential. And uh, 
writing this problem, we take the formulation of the Stokes wave problem for zero vorticity and then decorate the problem here and there with the constant vorticity perturbation and these are low order perturbations. And in fact, this is our point of view. This problem is the, the classical Stokes wave problem for zero vorticity perturbed by constant vorticity. And we try to mimic what has been successful for zero vorticity as much as possible. Another thing that I want to comment, uh, this super neat way of uh, splitting the vorticity into two parts, this is no longer available when we deal with non-constant uh, vorticity and that problem becomes much more challenging. Anyways, now the heart of matter of uh, this formulation is in equation number three, the Bernoulli equation. Here, little b on the right side, this is a Bernoulli constant, and this is a constant, but it's part of our unknown, and uh, it has to be determined as part of the solution. Now, uh, the waterway problem is a free bounded problem. So we are free to choose where we want to place our x and y axis. In fact, uh, we can uh, we can locate the, uh, we can slide down the location of the origin along the y-axis. So translating what y is so that we can assume with our loss of generality that B is zero from the outset, both in the infinite and the finite depth. And this will reduce the number of unknowns by one. And this seemingly little observation will go a long way later. Um, one last thing that I want to say, this formulation is still a free boundary problem because we don't know where the free surface is. So that uh, we use the component mapping, just like what uh, people did for the zero vorticity to reformulate this problem into a Babenko type and the result is here in the box. Here, these uh, are all the notation here is the same as before for the Babenko equation for zero vorticity. And these black terms, if you collect only these black terms, then you go back to the Babenko equation for zero vorticity. And these newly added terms in blue, they contain constant vorticity, little omega. And uh, uh, a solution to this uh, modified Babenko equation gives rise to a Stokes wave uh, for constant vorticity, provided that these two conditions uh, hold true. When the first condition fails to hold, then your fluid surface intersects itself. So there is a sub intersection, and we call such a solution a touching wave. When the second condition fails, then there is a stagnation point in your solution, and we call such a singular solution an extreme wave. Interestingly, when the first condition fails, there's nothing wrong with the solution y of u as a solution to the Babenko equation as a mathematical equation. But uh, difficulties arise when we try to interpret uh, this expression as uh, the parametric curve that gives a water wave. On the other hand, this expression in the second condition, this is one over the Jacobian of uh, the component mapping that is behind this Babenko equation. So that uh, when this expression vanishes, then both the component mapping, therefore the Babenko equation breaks down. Now, if you do not kill the Bernoulli constant, you still get a Babenko equation. But now you have one equation with the two unknowns, y and b, and this equation is further subject to a scalar constraint. And this system of a Babenko equation together with the, a scalar constraint is what Konstantin uh, uh, Strauss and Babaruka used for their uh, global bifurcation analysis. And this was uh, the formulation we used for our first paper. One important difference here, the linearized operator of uh, this Babenko equation together with the scalar constraint with respect to the unknown, which is made up of y and b, this operator is not self-adjoint, whereas uh, 
the linearized operator of uh, this single Babenko equation with respect to the one and the only unknown y is uh, sub azric And this makes a big difference uh, when we do numerical computations. Now, I will discuss our numerical findings. And before that, uh, I will discuss what the Simon and Salkman teach us. Um, the sign of vertices matters here, and it matters a lot. And uh, uh, our choice of sign convention is the same as uh, Telesta Silva and Peregrine because uh, that paper is uh, uh, seriously physical, whereas other papers are purely mathematical. And uh, now, um, I'm not sure like uh, my right is your right, but anyways, uh, in our world, uh, waves always travel to the right, and uh, uh, when background shear flow, if that travels in the same direction as the wave, that's negative vorticity in our definition. And the, the shear flow and waves against each other, that's positive vorticity. Okay. And unfortunately, this sign convention is the opposite of what Simon and Salkman chooses in their papers. So on this slide, we'll have to flip the sign of this uh, uppercase omega star. But anyways, uh, again, we collect the solution in the wave speed versus uh, stiffness uh, plane. And for zero vorticity, remember that uh, the wave speed uh, oscillates infinitely many times while the stiffness increases monotonically towards an extreme wave, although this solution curve is so small compared to other much bigger solution curves in this plot, so it's hard to see, it's impossible to see the oscillation. Now for the negative vorticity for our definition, the solution curve qualitatively behaves the same way as the zero vorticity. But for not so small, positive vorticity, something new happens. So for example, when the vorticity 1.5, and you see that uh, stiffness is not monotone anymore. The amplitude increases and decreases and increases. And it makes a fold in the solution curve. As we increase the vorticity, this fold grows uh, larger in size and if uh, the vertex is big enough, for example, when it is uh, 1.74 or even 1.705, then a gap appears in our solution curve that breaks our solution curve into two branches. And what's going on on the fold and the gap, I'm going to explain with our own computations. Uh, now, so vorticity omega is two. This is the largest value that the Simon and Salkman compute with the much lower accuracy. So that was our first uh, value that we tested our code to make sure that we produce uh, uh, Simon and Salkman and we also improve Simon and Salkman. Now on the upper left, this is uh, the wave speed uh, versus the stiffness plane. And uh, this green curve is a solution curve. And on the right and the lower uh, left, these are Stokes waves in the xy plane, and these blue curves are the fluid surface, the free surface, and the water leaves below these uh, blue curves. And these solutions we sample in the, along the various positions uh, along the solution curve uh, that uh, we labeled. Now, so you see that there is a fold in the solution curve. And what happens along the left side of board, as you increase the stiffness, therefore the amplitude, waves along the, that part portion is becoming more and more rounded. So you start from the beginning, uh, not overhanging waves, say like a wave A, and uh, this wave becomes more and more rounded. So soon it becomes overhanging waves and it goes until it reaches a touching wave, say wave B. And beyond this point B, the waves become even more rounded so that now the fluid region overlaps the neighboring one, for example, wave C. And clearly, this wave is, doesn't make sense as a water wave. So that uh, we call this uh, solution inadmissible. 
and the gap is made up of such in, inadmissible solutions. Anyway, we continue to solve uh, Babenko equations until we reach the peak of the, the gap or the fault, which is uh, farther away from here. So we we'll cut uh, the picture here. And then when we come back on the other side of uh, the fault, then the waves become less and less rounded as we decrease the stiffness so that uh, an inadmissible wave, wave B, will continue to another touching wave, wave E. And beyond this point, wave E, the solution becomes admissible again. And the passing the bottom of the, the board, then the wave, wave speed oscillates while, while the stiffness monotonically increases and uh, all the overhanging waves disappear and the crest becomes sharper towards the extreme wave, as you see in the, in the last part, just like for zero vorticity. So that's uh, the full life cycle of uh, the solution curve for this value of vorticity. And uh, I want to, so Simon and Stockman already noted that this uh, in their paper, and I want to emphasize again, now, not for not so small positive vorticity, so that you see faults and the gaps, then this uh, extreme wave at the, the end point of the solution curve is not the wave of greatest height anymore. Right? So that uh, we do not use the word the wave of greatest height uh, for non zero uh, constant vorticity. Now, I also want to say that the numerical scheme of the Simon and Zuckman, it diverges in the gap. So they were unable to show how the solution continues in the gap, although they correctly predicted what we should expect in the gap. Now, so you may ask that if their pneumatics stops at this first touching wave, how do they pick up the other branch of solutions? And the trick is that they assume that this solution curve will ultimately end at an extreme wave, which has a stagnation point. And then they solve a degenerate uh, for new equation that such, an, such, a, such a single solution must satisfy to estimate the location of this end point at the extreme wave. And then they go backward until they have to stop again at, at another touching wave and beyond that, that their solution, their method breaks down again. And this is maybe okay because uh, what's happening in the gap is a garbage we're throwing away anyways, right? But this is okay only when we know for sure that there is only one gap. There's nothing in between, like admissible between these two endpoints. And it turns out that there are more than one gap. So this approach is not okay. So for example, when the vortex is 2.5, you see on this upper left corner, there are two folds and two gaps. And what's happening along the first fold and the first gap is the same as before when vortex is two. Along the second fold, now the waves are uh, doubly bulbous in the sense that there are three inflection points uh, on either side of uh, the wave crest. But other than that, uh, the general tendency is the same. So along the left side of the second fold, waves become more and more rounded so that uh, it becomes a touching wave at the point of wave E. And beyond this wave, beyond this point, that the solution becomes inadmissible, for example, wave up. And then when it come back on the other side of the fold, the waves become less and less rounded. So it hits another, yet another touching wave at the wave G and beyond the point that the solution becomes admissible again. And after you go through two fours, then the, the remaining life of uh, the solution curve is the same as uh, zero vorticity. So uh, the wave speed oscillates, but the, the stiffness increases and uh, you're approaching an extreme wave. Now, while we stop here, as we increase vorticity more and more, we find more numbers of folds and gaps. 
So for example, when the vorticity is four, oops, four, then we find five pores and five gaps. And the, the story that I tell people is that uh, when for, for zero vorticity, there are infinitely many oscillations of wave speed. Now, as we increase vorticity, then the first oscillation, it becomes a fourth, and then part of this fourth becomes a gap, first gap. And as we increase vorticity more, then the second oscillation becomes a second fourth, and then the part of it becomes a second gap, and, and so on. So for any vorticity, any value of positive vorticity, there will be finitely many folds and finitely many gaps. Those numbers, I have no estimates, but after you go through all the folds and all the gaps, then the leftover life of the solution curve is the same as zero vorticity. And uh, so that all these solution curves will ultimately end at an extreme wave. And for an extreme wave, the angle at the crest is 120 degrees, no matter what the vorticity is. And the, the, the height of an extreme wave increases as we increase the vorticity. But the, for all the numerical computations we did, these extreme waves, none of these extreme waves have overhanging profile. So that we devise the conjecture of the Constant Strauss and Blavaruka that uh, we do not see the second possibility. So, an extreme, so the limiting wave is either extreme wave but no overhanging or a touching wave, but uh, we see a variety of uh, touching waves. So, that will be the, the topic of uh, the next part of my talk. Now, so, uh, when vorticity is large enough, then you have at least one gap in your solution curve that is bounded by two touching waves. Right. So on the left, I'm collecting those touching waves at the beginning of the gap for different values of uh, vorticity. And on the right, I'm collecting those touching waves at the end of the gap, first gap. And as uh, the vorticity increases uh, now, and in the beginning of the gap, the solutions, uh, the, the height of the solutions decrease monotonically towards a limiting value that's approximately 1.73. On the, at, the, on, at the end of this gap, the limiting value is one. That means the class to drop jump is the same as the period. Moreover, I hope it is clear to you as it is clear to me. Now, the shape of uh, the surface becomes uh, more and more closer to the perfect circle on top of a flat surface. So we think that the infinite vortice limit of these touching waves at the end of the first gap is a round fluid disk in rigid body rotation on top of a flat surface. What's happening at the beginning of the gap? Now, by the way, these waves resemble one of the Van den Broek's waves, uh, and it is the uh, same. So we are considering here uh, the infinite vorticity limit, and that's the same as zero gravity limit in this game. Now, let me make uh, some digression. Crapper in 1957, he discovered an exact solution to the capillary wave problem. And this problem is almost the same as Sox wave problem. So it's two dimensional and infinite depths and irrotational flow. It, instead having gravity, you have surface tension. So you are now like for the capillary wave problem, your surface tension is on, gravity is off. For the Stokes wave problem, gravity is on and surface tension is off. And this is exact solution. It solves exactly the stationary all equations together with two boundary conditions and no approximations. So this is an extremely rare and special circumstance. It is just like a set of squares to function solves uh, KDD. Now, uh, and the, the formula in the box uh, will give you the, the shape of the free surface for this uh, capillary wave problem and the corresponding uh, conformal mapping is the identity map. Now here, 
we have an exact solution. So we don't do numerics. Uh, we simply plot the solution, right? And then what happens uh, to this problem is uh, as we increase the amplitude, the class becomes the flatter and the troughs become more curved, the opposite of what's happening in the gravity wave world. And the, the wave of greatest height, the limiting wave is a touching wave and the, the corresponding stiffness is approximately 0 0.73. Of course, there is an equation that spits out this number so that we can compute more digits. And uh, uh, this number happens to agree all the digits of we compute for this uh, infinite vorticity limit for the constant vorticity. Moreover, when we plot this uh, touching crapper wave on this same panel, then, and that's a dotted curve, and it is indistinguishable from a touching wave of this uh, constant vorticity problem when the vorticity is large enough, for example, when vorticity is 14 then this yellowish curve and the dotted curve are almost indistinguishable. So that I think it is clear that uh, the infinite vorticity limit of uh, this uh, of touching waves at the beginning of the uh, first gap is uh, the limiting crepper wave. And when now for the crepper wave, we have an explicit solution. So that uh, uh, recently, together with Miles Wheeler, what we did is uh, we plug in the Clapper's formula. Uh, we plug in this Clapper's formula to the constant vortice problem with zero gravity and verify. So that uh, this Clapper's formula solves the constant vortice problem when the gravity is zero. And this is not just happening for the touching wave, but all Clapper solutions. They are all solutions to the constant vorticity when the gravity is zero. So there is uh, a completely unexpected and surprising connections between surface tension and constant vorticity. Now, I want to also point out that these two problems uh, cap capillary wave problem and constant with this problem, they share the same fluid surface. They sh share the same shape of the surface, but uh, the streamlines beneath, uh, they are completely different. Uh, for the capillary wave problem, for the crop solutions, streamlines are equal to free surface. So if you strip off the outer layer, then the leftover is a solution. On the other hand, for the constant vorticity problem, you see cat's eye flow and the internal stagnation and the many other interesting phenomena. Now, to continue, on this left, the, I collect uh, touching waves at the beginning of the second gap when it happens. And on the right, these are touching waves at the end, at the end of the second gap and the infinite vortice limit of the, uh, the beginning of the second gap is a perfectly round fluid disk on top of a limiting crapper wave. And on, at the end, it is a fluid disk on top of another fluid disk. And to continue even more, now we know that when vortice is four or larger, there are amidst the five gaps. And these are, the touching waves uh, at the beginning and end of gaps number one through five. And uh, these uh, green curves are for this four and the yellowish curves are for, for this 14. And what you want to take away from here is uh, when we move to the uh, one gap to the next one, then we only need to add a one more fluid bubble on top of the solutions in the previous gap. That's uh, how these solutions are made of. So we can, in principle, can have as many fluid bubbles as we like if we have a large enough vorticity. Now, I am going to discuss the technical aspects of this work, but I'm going to be super brief about it. Now, in 2000, CSNE, this uh, society, they published in the house journal 
what they named the top 10 algorithms in the 20th century. And this is the geekiest list that I've ever, ever seen. But I think this is still good for publicity. So I'm using this. Uh, so we use uh, two algorithms uh, in this list, uh, the fast Fourier transform and the Krilov subspace method. Uh, we, uh, in the Babenko equation, the non-local operator is a Hilbert transform. So it is a multiplier, simply a multiplier in the Fourier space. So that we can do all the computation in the Fourier space. Uh, and the, that's why this FFP is useful. Now, Krilov subspace method, in case you're not familiar with it, this is a method how to solve the matrix equation AX equals B. And there are like a collection of methods uh, here. And uh, when we solve the linearized problem of the Babenko equation for a truncated uh, Fourier series, then the, our problem becomes uh, exactly AX equals B. So we use uh, some uh, Krilov subspace method. Uh, and I don't want to be too ridiculous here, but uh, this Krilov subspace method are very popular and extremely useful. It is behind the Google search engine, and also it has some relevance uh, to machine learning techniques. Uh, so what I want to say uh, is that uh, uh, you learn some useful things uh, while doing this numerical work. But uh, uh, we are simply using these uh, existing algorithms. We don't improve these algorithms. Uh, but what we improve instead is uh, mathematical understanding of the Stokes wave. So all our new technology is devoted to better understand the mathematics of this problem, not uh, uh, improving the algorithms. Uh, so I, there are two items that I want to highlight on that aspect. First, again, uh, the numerical method in the 80s and 90s, they break down in the gap. And we had no problem computing these overlapping waves. Uh, we are not um, numerically more sophisticated than people in the 80s. Actually, we use the same Newton's iteration that the people in the 80s and 90s used. But what we are more sophisticated is uh, mathematical formulation of this problem. Again, we're relying on the Babenko equation. And in the Babenko equation, the non-local operator is a Fourier multiplier. So it does not see any difficulties when we are computing with the overlapping waves as long as it defines a good function. Whereas in the 80s, uh, people used uh, the uh, boundary integral equation that involves uh, some singular integral operator, typically the Cauchy integral operator. And the corner goes bad when the underlying solution has a sub-intersection. So that's where we win over the people in the 80s and 70s and 90s. Now, as I said briefly, in our first paper, we used the formulation of the Babenko equation, uh, subsect 2, a scalar, a scalar constraint. And for that, uh, this problem is not self assuring So we used the GMS method. That's one of the Krilov uh, subspace method. And that method was not nearly as powerful as uh, uh, powerful enough so that uh, we can compute all the solutions that I'm presenting today in this talk. Later, we became a better version of ourselves after we realized that we can kick out this uh, extra uh, constraint by setting the, the probability constant to be zero. And then we can simply deal with one sub assoint uh, operator. And so that uh, in our second paper, we used the, the uh, conjugate gradient method instead of GMS. And this was the method that Sergei used for the uh, Babenko equation for zero vorticity. And now this is uh, only for the experts in the audience. The CG method, the conjugate gradient method is proved to converge it for PSD, like positive semi-definite matrices. And uh, uh, the Babenko equation is not the same positive PSD matrix, so that uh, there's uh, no guarantee that the, the CG method uh, will converge for the Babenko equation, even for zero vorticity. Nonetheless, so when Sergei computed the, the solutions using the CG method, the solution converged everywhere when we computed. But uh, recently, when we looked uh, at uh, uh, to resolve uh, these tiny oscillations for non-zero vorticity, 
then we found that the CG methods sometimes they don't converge in. And that's uh, what it's supposed to do. So that the recently we switched to conjugate residual or minimize method. But the bottom line is the self assuredness uh, This was uh, the one, uh, one, one and only kind of contribution that I make uh, in this problem. And uh, I, it was interesting that because, uh, you know, I thought that, I used to think that we have to work hard to, to have a good formulation so that we can prove a theorem. And then uh, numerical computation is a matter of doing it. That's what I used to think, but uh, uh, it's not the case here. Um, and uh, this uh, global bifurcation analysis that uh, uh, Walter did with ADN and UZEN, this is a deep analysis result, but uh, it does not necessarily use uh, on all the properties of the solution uh, or the equations. For example, uh, they don't need it. Uh, they don't need to use self assuredness. Uh, one of the key ingredients in the bifurcation analysis is the Fred Olin property. And for that matter, for the purpose, more or less, you need to control the principal part of the equation, right? And then the rest uh, you can treat as uh, uh, a lower term and just bound. And for the numerical computation, I realized that, of course, the principal part matters a lot. And we work very hard to control this principal part in our analysis, in our computation. But for numerical computation, each and every term matters. We cannot just throw like a lower term, say, OK, this is lower term. And uh, so we, not only we need to understand the, the main part of the equation, but we have to understand the, the equation as a whole. So that uh, uh, this uh, uh, self assuredness is needed more for this numerical computation than it is needed for global bifurcation analysis. But now we, we know this, uh, we have this uh, extra very nice property for this equation and that opens up uh, possibilities. Uh, so we can now use this property to prove things that uh, was uh, not uh, possible before and I'm working on this direction. Now, um, that's more or less uh, I have to say on this uh, already published work. I have prepared a slide for some of my current uh, like a working progress and that's uh, about the angle of Stokes wave. But I'm also uh, noticed that uh, I have marked at like a 15 minutes. So I can either stop here and take questions and I give a short lecture on this uh, item for those who are interested, or I can make, a, I can give a very short uh, uh, lecture on this one. So it's, uh, what do you think? Continue? Okay. So one of the things that I'm currently working on is uh, angle of a Stokes wave. And by that, I mean, so say, okay, my drawing is really bad, but say this is a Stokes wave and I, uh, and the angle, I measure the angle that a tangent line makes with a positive, a horizontal. So this is the angle that I'm talking about here. For zero vorticity for the extreme wave, this angle, the maximum angle on the one over one period from minus pi to pi is uh, 30 degrees and it happens at the crest, at the extreme wave. So it was surprising when the cloud proved that, that this maximum angle exceeds 30 degrees for an almost extreme way. And as John mentioned, this uh, work was announced much earlier than it was proved, uh, published. And then AMIC later provided a remarkable upper bound of uh, 31.25 degrees that holds for all Stokes waves. Okay. And he compares uh, his result against the 30.37 and this is a limiting with angle uh, that uh, happened, the limiting angle as uh, you get closer to the extreme rate. And this was computed, uh, this was uh, uh, reported by Longhi Higgins and Fox, uh, and they used, the, they combined the 
image computation and the formal analysis. And there are many new medical works uh, before and after Longi Higgins and Fox uh, that all like directly or indirectly addresses this angle business. Uh, and the best work uh, in that direction is the paper of Chandler and Graham in 1993, where they confirm that uh, this uh, angle of Longi Higgins is sharp and they provide the 10 decimal digits of uh, that angle, the limiting angle. That's for zero vorticity. Now, for non-zero vorticity, for negative and weakly positive vorticity, and I believe that uh, this vorticity doesn't have to be constant. Recently, Walter and uh, Mars, and also Walter together with an undergraduate student, proved the upper bound of 45 degrees for some, I think, a large class of uh, Stokes waves, but uh, under some conditions that uh, this wave has to satisfy. Now, so our goal here is so we want, we are, so for constant vorticity, for non, first of all, for uh, non zero vorticity, for positive vorticity, you can have overhanging waves. Uh, and for that, in that situation, this angle doesn't make sense very much. However, we saw that numerically, at least for positive, at least for constant vorticity, close to an extreme wave, all the overhanging waves disappear. So near an extreme wave, we can make sense of this angle. So that's uh, uh, the subject of our study here. So we want to um, see if there is a limiting angle that's, that's analogous to the Longi Higgins and Fox angle for zero vorticity. Can, is there such a thing for non-zero constant vorticity? And we want to study this uh, numerically using continuation method. And uh, now, uh, our tentative uh, conclusion can be summarized uh, in these two figures. Uh, on the left, this, uh, these curves, colored curves, they are solution curves, but uh, they are plotted. On the vertical axis, we measure the maximum angle. And uh, on horizontally, uh, this is wrong, we measure how close we are to the extreme wave. So when at zero, this is extreme wave, and we measure how close we are. Now, one thing that, uh, there are a couple of things that I want to remark. So for all these different values of a vorticity we tested, the local maximum angle, it is a monotone. So it does not oscillate when all the other quantities, uh, wave speed and energy and all the other quantities oscillate. They are all always monotone. And uh, for zero vorticity, it monotonically increases towards this limiting value that was suggested by Longi Higgins Fox. What's more surprising is uh, this angle is shared by other non constant, uh, other non zero constant vorticity. So there is a limiting angle of maximum, there is a limiting maximum angle, and that's a 30.37 something for regardless of what the vorticity is. Just like the angle at the crest of an extreme wave is 30 degrees, no matter what the vorticity. So this angle is universal. On the right, what you see is, uh, again, on the vertical axis is the maximum ang is angle, and the horizontal axis is the x-axis, uh, but uh, uh, in the logarithmic scale, because otherwise uh, we don't see anything. We fix the vorticity, and we pick uh, three different uh, waves. Uh, they are marching towards uh, the extreme wave. And this value we pick, omega is one, this is not so small. And uh, what I want you to take away from here is that there is a global maximum angle. This does not happen for zero vorticity. So there is global maximum angle that's uh, much higher than 30 degree. For vorticity 1.0, it is uh, 50 something. And this value increases as we increase the vorticity, but it never exceeds the 90 degree. So overhanging does not appear. And the location of uh, this uh, maximum, global maximum, is close to the trough. This is a class to the trough. In addition, there is a local maximum angle that's uh, around 30 degrees, and the, the limiting value is uh, 30.37. And the location of this local maximum point approaches 
towards the opposes the end of the crust as we get closer and closer to the extreme wave. And there are a lot of uh, potential theorems that in this uh, in this wizard, uh, but uh, probably these are some of the hardest things that uh, we can prove or that we can try to prove uh, in this uh, subset. And with that, I will stop. I'm done. <laughs> Okay, so um, if you'll give me one second, I'm going to give everyone the right to unmute themselves. Um, okay, uh, everyone now has the right to unmute themselves. Vera, uh, as a reminder, you're now accidentally muted. Um, so uh, do we have any questions or comments uh, for Vera? What's the horizontal axis in that last graph? X? Last graph is uh, like, so like a, our x-axis is from zero to pi. And I put that in logarithmic scale because uh, this maximum is happening extremely close to the crust. So when X is extremely close to zero, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I don't know that like, you can actually read uh, these numbers. So they are logarithmic scale, so like uh, from one to like uh, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus four, and so on. Yeah, yeah. you can read so, them. So that that yeah, that, so that uh, I'm I'm taking zero to pi and to put them in the logarithmic scale. So that high point, that maximum point on the right side of that yes. graph. Yes. Uh huh. That that it's close to ten to the so close to one. That's it, one. Yes. So again, like I so like it's a zero to pi, but I like uh, normalize so it's zero to one. So oh, okay. the so that uh, in the physical world. This is a cluster to drop at zero to one in the horizontal axis. And I just put that, uh, I, I just uh, filter through the logarithmic. So if I can sketch a solution that uh, this uh, solution of this in the XY plane, it will look like something like this. So here's XY plane, uh, here's XY plane and zero to one. And uh, so uh, there is tall wall of, uh, no, I'm, I'm really bad at uh, this drawing with the uh, pencil. So there is a tall wall of uh, um, like a with tall, like a wall of water, right? And then at the crest, it is a flat. If you zoom in very, 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 very closely, then there is a little dip of uh, angle of 30.37, but uh, it's a static to 30 degree. So something like that. So this is the shape of almost extreme wave but for not so small positivity. So that uh, this is uh, getting taller and that this uh, is kind of stiff, uh, like a wall of water. Uh -huh. um, I don't know, like I'm, I'm being clear here. Let me- Wait, uh, Where's the big angle on that? Uh, big angle is this angle. Where is it? This angle. Uh, this is- uh, Oh, it's here. the angle of a wall. Yeah. So like huh. when it's like it drops uh, with a big slope, and this huh. uh, like a big this slope is getting close and closer to vertical. So it's getting close and close to ninety degree, but it never exceeds ninety degree. As we increase vorticity, this increases slightly. We compute it up to eighty-eight point something of this angle, and then we just stop. But uh, of course, there's no proof that uh, this extreme wave has no overhanging profile, not yet. But uh, our pneumatic strongly suggests that uh, it gets uh, extremely close to vertical, but it never becomes more than vertical. Uh -huh. hmm. um, actually, I have a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, so in um, the second part of your talk, where you have the sort of stacks of uh, mm -hmm. disks uh, on, on, on top of one another, I was curious, um, is it the case that, so, so as, you, as you push the, the parameter to the limit there, it, it, they, they all seem to sort of come together and, and touch. I was curious, right. are, they, are they all coming at essentially the same, oh. do, they, do they kiss simultaneously? Or is there like one that touches down here while the others are still an epsilon apart? Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. We didn't look at uh, that carefully. So like uh, how many, when it touches, how many points it touches, right? Exactly. And, uh, and so let's say, so here, 
for example, so like uh, let's look at the green curves, and it seems touchy in all these blocks, right? So that, uh, um, but on, on, at the same time, this neck is much narrower than this neck. So uh, maybe possibly this neck closes first before this neck, but uh, at the same time, maybe both can be closed uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. That I don't know. Yeah. I, I can take a look at a bit. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, other, other questions? Uh, so, Vera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if I understand well, at the on both sides of the 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 gap, on one side mm -hmm. you have this crapper wave. Yes. Which uh, would be a solution to the the um, zero to to the the capillary water wave, mm -hmm. and on the other mm -hmm. side you have a perfect disc. Mm -hmm. which I guess would also be a solution to capillary yes. water wave. Yes, because it has a constant curvature. Right, so you have to put together like a constant, like a coverage one and coverage zero solution, and it meets mm -hmm. at one point. Yes. So, so both could, could both solutions have some flavor of uh, like a surface tension waves. Yeah. So, could you have guessed that a priori? Is there a, an understanding as to why the infinite vorticity limit uh, converges to the capillary? Problem, so at least a, formally. This is a, like my bad quote from Pellegrin and the Telesta service paper. So, you know, like a, uh, when voltage is large first, uh, so like a, the gravity is a minor effect. That's why we drop the gravity. So this uh, old phenomena is uh, uh, dominated by, I guess, uh, driven by vorticity. And vorticity, um, it's a, uh, well, so it's not exactly rotation of the fluid, but nonetheless, uh, this is uh, also like a rotating fact, right? So that if we like uh, can focus on this rotating effect of the vorticity, maybe that also has uh, shares some um, like uh, properties together with this capillarity, which try to minimize or like, optimize the, the, the curvature. And that's uh, uh, really like a, uh, not so mathematical or physical explanation. This is a mystery to us. Uh, we found this uh, through our like uh, computations and we of course did not expect at all that we would find the some surface tension effect down this road. That uh, this was completely unexpected, unexpected thing. And uh, we can verify mathematically, but we do not know how to explain this, uh, not yet completely. And so how did you have the idea to try to match it with the crapper wave? Was it just because the uh, fake... <laughs> that was a, that was a, my pure accident? It was a, it must be a, one of my good days. So I was we had uh, another project. Uh, we were computing uh, capillary yeah. gravity waves uh, because uh, that uh, there the, the the existence theory numerically is still also not complete. So that was uh, a, a project. Another project. So I was looking at the Crappers wave just for that, a completely different uh, uh, project. And then suddenly this number arises, and then I realized, oh, this is something I'm already familiar with. It's a, it was a pure accident. <laughs> and so, just if you now pick some kind of random point inside one of those branches, so mm -hmm. before the first gap, mm -hmm. and somehow is there a way that you can let vorticity go to infinity and see oh. something that would be a solution to a capillary way? So way? you mean like a, a pick some point here, here in the gap, and then I can continue like a, I know, uh, I mean, no? And so you mean analytically, like right? Sorry? Uh, maybe like a, like a pick some you mean, Benoit, you mean analytically, you might look at at taking very big. Oh, or numerically. Very close. Yeah. Uh, no, it was just if you take something, so not inside the gap, but before the gap. Mm -hmm. uh, so where oh, you have a nice gap, solution, okay. but not an mm -hmm. extreme one. Is mm -hmm. there a way that you can move, um, sure. push it to infinity and get yes. Yes, Some... yes, that will be, so as I said, uh, so now we have a proof and our proof says that, um, 
not only the touching wave, but all the other these uh, Kepler curves, uh, all the other curves, uh, they ah. also solve uh, constant potency problem with zero certain with zero gravity. So you would see that you yeah, so the, all, the formula this formula comes with one parameter a and for all admissible value of a this uh, formula solves the constant of this problem with zero with gravity. Yeah. And so you would conjecture that if you pick any point it should if it has a limit it should sure. be one of those curves. Uh, ah. That's uh, what I think but uh, we don't have uniqueness proof. So. Wow. Wow. Anybody else? Other questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask something about the um, about the first part that that you showed, like mm -hmm. when you had like the panels labeled with the letters, like the first time you showed the the gaps and the folds. Mm -hmm. Can you go to that slide? Okay. Uh. Do you mean do you either that or more, yeah okay. this one is better yeah so mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask if along the gap mm -hmm. uh, you see like the the bubble like inside disappear or not it looks as in C it's almost about to disappear and then it grows when you go to D. But uh, I wonder what happens what is bubble so there is no bubble ah. these two like oh, oh, this is okay uh, okay so think, yeah. think of the so bubble overlapping. better in B so like look at B in, look at B okay. Yeah, and then, right. then ah, I see. Yeah, so this, I mean there is the a bubble. bubble. Yes, there is a bubble, and yeah. uh, when when you immediately continue from B, then this is a bubble, right? Yes. And uh, we didn't actually compute that many uh, of these inadmissible solutions because uh, well, they don't have a, they have zero physical meaning. But mm -hmm. yes, we do have bubbles, and they can like shrink or like uh, they can be expanded. But uh, we didn't pay too much attention to that because here this overlapping is a big warning sign. Yeah, yeah, but I was just wondering if it like uh -huh. sort of disappeared and appeared or just shrunk. Uh, let's see. So like uh, that, that the extreme behavior is going to happen at the peak of uh, this gap. So the, pl the correct place to look at is uh, this uh, wave F mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, it doesn't have to disappear. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, anybody else? Okay, uh, well, let's, um, let's thank Vera one more time. Thank you. Very nice talk, Vera. Um, let me also remind you that uh, next week we will be back with Miles Wheeler, who will be talking about uh, solitary waves and fronts. Hope, hope to see you next week. <laughs>